Okay, so today we'll talk about quadratic form minimization and least squares. Both extremely important topics and very much related. And they're important for several reasons that I will try to outline right now. We'll start with quadratic form minimization, which is something that you did right now on the quiz that didn't count. So here is why it is important. First, let me tell you what you just did. I essentially gave you a function of three variables. Yes, I wrote it in matrix form because we're all students of linear algebra. So if there's a complicated function and we're able to reveal its structure by writing it in matrix form, then of course we'll do it. And so when we have a function that's essentially a quadratic function with some linear terms, and you might also expect a constant term, but that's an inconsequential term usually. So we only have quadratic and linear terms, and we can write it in matrix form, then of course we'll do it. But from the calculus point of view, what you're looking at is just a function of three variables. And so I asked you to find where the minimum occurs, the equation that determines where the minimum occurs. And that's why the constant term didn't matter. Because the constant term only determines what the minimum is, but not where it occurs. And in all, virtually all applications, it just tends to be the more interesting question is, where does the minimum occur, as opposed to what's the value of the function that that minimum is? For a variety of reasons. Number one, energy. A lot of physics is, is described from the point of view of energy minimization. And then even dynamics is based on least action principle, or maybe now people call it stationary action principle, because you don't always have a minimum, but the ideas are analogous. And Euler said, there is nothing in this world that's not described by a minimum principle. So describing natural phenomena within the framework of minimization or optimization more generally is, is a very common approach. It's really a very common worldview for reasons that are very important and I could, I could discuss them for hours. But it seems that the world since Newton's time has moved on from talking about forces to talking about energy. In any one of your physics or chemistry or any other classes, you spend more time talking about energy than you are talking about force. In many aspects, the discussion that's framed in terms of energy as opposed to forces is more reliable, more systematic, more powerful in some ways, and much less intuitive, because we can all feel a force and we don't know what the heck energy is. But the math works out better in some ways, and especially the internal consistency of a physical model is often guaranteed to a certain degree when the model itself is formulated in terms of energy. And so we like talking about energy, and we like talking about energy minimization. And so here, we're really considering the simplest possible function of many variables for which the question of minimum is interesting. What would be that function in one dimension? If I asked you to tell me one function, just of a single variable x, for which finding the minimum is not trivial, but at least but is a little bit interesting, what would you tell me? I'm sorry? Yeah, but what function, of what function? What would be the most interesting function? The simplest possible function which has a minimum. Let me put it that way. What's the simplest? X squared. I completely agree. X squared. But it's also a little bit boring because the minimum is at zero. So you shift it a little bit. You would say X squared minus BX. And then maybe make it a little bit more interesting by putting an A here, right? AX squared minus BX. And for this function, doing all the calculations in your head, tell me where the minimum occurs. Right, B over 2A. So I don't like that too, of course. So I will put a 1 half here. Now where does the minimum occur? <laughs> 
b over a, or the way I'll write it, at ax equals b. Okay, that I would call one half is for convenience. Hey, there it is. That's why this one half is here. This is the simplest interesting function that has a minimum. Now, we should always look for the simplest problem that you can solve. So when you look for the simplest problem with many variables that has a minimum, the simplest function that has a minimum, it would be this function. And do you see how complexity in a way explodes? The structure is still there. But the degrees of freedom now went from 2 to, we can call this either 9 or 6. 6 because the matrix is symmetric. So 6 plus 3, 9. Okay? But in terms of the structure, this is still as simple a problem as we can possibly consider. That's why we're dealing with this form, quadratic form. So that's what a quadratic form, so this would be a quadratic form with a shift. Because it's really this part that's usually called the quadratic form. So quadratic form with a linear shift, just so that the minimum is not at zero. Suppose there wasn't a shift. Let's talk about that. So of course I chose a positive definite matrix. You can make sure of that if, you, if you'd like. And I had to. Because if this matrix wasn't positive definite, then there wouldn't be a minimum. Because somewhere it would be positive. For some combination of x, y, and z, it would be positive. For another combination of x, y, and z, it would be negative. And so you would take that one for which it's negative. And by simply multiplying that vector where the negative occurs by a large number, you will always get this term. Well, now we're just talking about without the linear term. There won't be a minimum. It can be as small as possible. And even with a shift, because this is quadratic and this is linear, this term will come to dominate this one. So there cannot possibly be a minimum if this matrix is not positive definite. So of course I chose it positive definite. And so this is the simplest possible function that you can expect to find in the natural world that describes some kind of equilibrium where the principle of minimum energy applies. So that's why we're studying the simplest possible function. And it turns out that even though the function is best written, now I'm going to say something about matrix notation and its flaws. I've pretty much spent a quarter and a half by now exalting the virtues of matrix multiplication. Because I won't repeat, right? It's great structure. It, I will repeat. <laughs> Beautiful structure. Invokes our algebraic intuition. Perfect for analysis on paper. Just a fantastic, fantastic device that transforms the subject. Really makes it linear algebra. So, and I would occasionally mention that there are some flaws. Well, you found the flaw here. Because the simplest problem, here it is written in matrix notation. If I asked you to find where the minimum occurs, and I asked you to stick to matrix notation, you would very much struggle with this expression. Because what does it mean to take the derivative with respect to x? Or, right, that's your unknown. x is the vector. x is not this x. x is x, y, z. We always make, commit this crime of using the same letter for two different meanings. But what would you do? You would be completely at a loss. There are some books that attempt to define what it means to take the derivative with respect to x. But then here there is x transpose, so it's just a mess. Matrix notation is flawed here. And the flaw comes from the fact that when you're trying to do calculus, which you just did, right? On a linear algebra expression, you basically needed to refer to the individual entries of the matrix. Individual entries here, individual x's and y's, and the same thing here. And matrix notation is opposite. Its purpose is opposite of whatever you would, you would need to do where you need to refer to the individual entries. It's all about the blocks. It's all about thinking, it's all about thinking of this as a single object and this as a single object. So matrix notation is not great for mixing linear algebra and calculus. And at the same time, mixing, not mixing, combining, working together, 
of linear algebra's calculus is where all of, I'm overreaching, applied mathematics takes place. So what, it, what all of this is is a plug for my favorite subject, which is tensor calculus. And what you will find out right now, what you just found out, is that it took you 15 minutes of analysis that wasn't complicated at all, but was cumbersome. You, some of you filled a whole page of calculations just figuring out where the, the equation that determines where the minimum occurs. And if you use tensor calculus, and there is a video I have on YouTube for quadratic form minimization and tensor terms, it's, it's one line to derive what you just derived. So that's the second reason why this is so important. And the third reason is what you'll see on the other board, I think, which is uh, least squares. Least squares, uh, a lot of engineers would say that's the, perp that's the purpose of inner products. Least squares has to do, algebraically speaking, with solving AX equals B, I'm just speaking about it in generalities right now, for a matrix that's much taller than it is wide. In other words, it has many more equations than you have variables. Very few columns in the column space, no, well, not in the column space, very few columns from Rn, so there is no chance of solving it exactly. But maybe you can solve it approximately. Maybe you can solve it as best you can. And that's what least squares does. So that's what we're going to see in just a moment. OK. But let me mention what you found here. What you found here is that the minimum occurs at x that's determined by the equation ax equals b. And so the analogy with the trivial, not trivial, simple list, 1D case, is complete. But the way you did it, just to document it, was essentially a roundabout way of doing it. You multiplied this out, you got rid of the matrix notation. You just wrote it out as a single long expression with six terms here plus three terms here. Then you applied standard multivariable calculus. You found three partial derivatives and equated each one of them to zero. And then you said to yourself, my goodness, these are three linear equations. I will organize them in a matrix. So you went back to matrix notation because of course that's what you would do. And you said, lo and behold, it's the exact same matrix as we see right here. And the right hand side was this vector right here. So quadratic form minimization, quadratic form with a shift, is basically comes down to solving AX equals B. And that's just about all at this point that I can tell you about quadratic form minimization. Whenever you're presented with a problem like this, you just have to solve AX equals B. And so this is a much greater takeaway. We just learned that the fundamental problem of linear algebra, or at least its first pillar, comes from a minimization problem. I just quoted Euler just a moment ago who said that there is nothing in nature, his statement was more religious in nature, he, he was describing God's way of creating the universe, and he was essentially saying that God based the universe on the principle of minimization, one way or another. So a very strong statement. This is a small microcosm of it, that the fundamental problem of linear algebra, its first pillar, is a minimization problem. To solve AX equals B is to minimize this function, this quadratic form with the linear shift. So as a matter of fact, if you're solving AX, if your research yielded AX equals B, but a huge AX equals B, let's say 5 million by 5 million, that's 25 trillion entries. But the way things usually happen, uh, the matrix is sparse. Do you know what matrices look like often in research? Yes, it's big, but there are lots of zeros and there are just some non-zero entries. If you start doing Gaussian elimination, the matrix will cease being sparse and you will basically run out of space. 
you will not be able to fit a 5 billion by 5 billion matrix with all non-zeros in, in the memory of the computer. So Gauss elimination becomes an impractical way of solving an equation. If, and if you don't run out of space, at the very least, it'll be very slow. So what people do, especially if you have a positive definite A, if you don't have a positive definite A, it's a little bit more challenging. But you will say, instead of solving this, I will minimize this. I will pick a random x, and then I will go in the direction that would make this expression smaller. If you remember your multivariable calculus, you have to march in the direction opposite of the gradient. Does that ring a bell at all? And it's called gradient descent. So what you will actually do, and the gradient is ax, just like the derivative here is ax. The gradient here is the vector ax. So what you will do, you will start with a random x, and then you will replace it with x minus alpha ax, the, your current location, minus a small step in the direction of the gradient. This is the most naive approach. There are much better approaches. But this most naive approach, which takes half a second to program, will give you your answer, approximately at least, much more quickly than Gaussian elimination. And this is called an iterative method, not a direct method like Gaussian elimination. Go through all the steps, get your answer. This is an iterative method. Start somewhere, make it a little better, make it a little better, make it a little better. And this, in this naive form, there's a much less naive form that works a lot better, called conjugate gradients. But even this naive approach will get you your approximate answer instantly, relatively speaking. Okay? So wh why am I saying this? I'm saying this that having an optimization perspective on a problem you think you know well always is an additional benefit, sometimes tremendous additional benefit. Okay? So that's all I have to say about quadratic form minimization. We'll now switch to least squares, a very important topic, especially in engineering, and especially because of the geometric interpretation that we'll add next time. <laughs>